Welcome to Green Building Matters, the podcast that matters for green building professionals. Learn insight in green buildings as we interview today's experts in lead and well. We'll learn from their career paths, war stories, and all things green, because green building matters. And now our host, and yes, he has every lead and well credential, here's Charlie Cicchetti. Be sure to check out the Green Building Matters community, where you can have unlimited exam prep for any of the professional credential exams you're tackling next, as well as putting your continued education on autopilot, saving time with GBS reporting your hours on your behalf. Check it out, gbes.com slash join. Now, enjoy this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. Today, I'm joined by a lead fellow, but this is one of the earliest lead fellows I've had here on, on the podcast. Uh, Dan Burgoyne's coming to us from California. Dan, thanks for jumping on today. Oh, glad to join you. I always like to just say, hey, take us back. You know, where'd you grow up? And tell us a little bit about your uh, education, going to college. Uh, where'd you get your start? Yeah, so I grew up in Eugene, Oregon in the 60s and 70s. And uh, as a lot of people know, that's the home of the Oregon Ducks, although uh, I didn't go to school there. You know, there were a lot of, uh, you know, Oregon was and still is a pretty large timber industry. And uh, like the, you know, it rains a lot there. It rains most of the year. In fact, uh, in the summertime, uh, people don't tan, they rust. (laughs) <laughs> That's really the way it was growing up. I didn't own an umbrella till I moved to California. So it's uh, interesting, but that's kind of the path that I've taken. So I grew up and uh, there was, uh, when I grew up, I had a different career in mind up until I was in, uh, about to enter high school. I took a career ed class and it said that I would be either a good architect or chemical engineer. So that following year, I enrolled in both uh, chemistry and the drafting class. You dropped after one. <laughs> yeah, after one week, I dropped chemistry, and the rest has been history. Well, that's so I, I pursued architecture. Went to a, a number of schools. Uh, started out with a in a drafting trade school in in Arizona in the Phoenix area. I went to Brigham Young University for a couple of years transferred to the uh, West Valley College in Saratoga, California, where I started studying architecture again. And then I finished up at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo in architecture. Love that part of the coast. And uh, that probably kept you in California after that. Uh, and my mom, uh, Dan, actually grew up outside of Eugene and uh, Springfield, Oregon. So oh, yes. I have some ties to Oregon and, and as an early, early state that was into sustainability and, and recycling, and uh, we can get into all that. Um, so that's where you went to college, and now tell us a little bit about the early part of your career. What, where'd you get your start there on the work side? Yeah, so I was, you know, in, in, Eugene, in and around Eugene, there was a lot of, uh, I guess you would call them hippies back in the 70s, sure. a lot of people that lived very simply. Um, I didn't really uh, identify with their lifestyle, but I kind of admired their simplicity and some of their shelters. I was fascinated in the 70s, starting in high school with passive design, earth sheltered homes. I read everything I could find on those subjects. It was still kind of new. There wasn't much active solar around. It was all very experimental, but there was a lot of passive design. So I, some of the first things I remember reading, I, I remember reading some of the books by there was an architect named Malcolm Wells on earth sheltered homes and underground houses. This just fascinated me. Uh, he was a architect and, and pioneer of modern day earth sheltered homes. And of course, we know that earth sheltered homes go back many centuries and wonderful examples uh, through different parts of the world. Another book that I read that really impressed me was uh, called The Passive Solar Energy Book. So that was in the also in the late 70s and uh, was written by a young engineer named Ed Mosria. So okay. you may have heard of him. 
Sure. So as, as you know, uh, Ed continues to be an inspiration to many today through his 2030 challenge and a lot of other efforts. When I started out in my, in my, you know, I worked in my career as an architect for a number of years and then got into project management and ended up at the state of California in the Department of General Services. So I, uh, after a year at the state, I uh, interviewed for and accepted a position as sustainability manager, which is my current position here. I've been in that role for now for 17 years. Wow. So my director at the time said, hey, you should look into LEED and you should look into U.S. Green Building Council. I heard they, they have a lot of green building things that you should become familiar with. So I looked on the internet, looked up the USGBC. This was in 2002. Wow. And uh, there was a Northern California chapter at the time, still is, but they happened to have a chapter meeting coming up. So I made a trip from Sacramento out to the Bay Area. It happened to be a presentation by Kevin Hydes and John Peel with the Packard Foundation on a report and matrix that they had done looking at life cycle of buildings and various levels of of greenness, I guess you could say. That really sparked my interest because I wasn't really used to looking at long-term uh, benefits and effects of buildings, but it was uh, it really kind of got me thinking and got me interested in in uh, green building and what can I do in my my role uh, at the state to to help our buildings become more sustainable. That's fantastic, and you know, Leeds been around about eighteen years now, and. I think you went after your first lead credential shortly after that chapter meeting, if I'm understanding your background yep. a little bit, Dan. So you you went all in there. Um, and so l- let me unpack that early part of your sustainability journey. Was it all about energy efficiency first? And then, of course, these rating systems, programs like LEED, and what else can we do? You know, those weren't there at the time, but they came later. Uh, was it truly about energy efficiency in the 70s? Was that a common theme? Well, I think it was more about doing more with less and okay. uh, trying to get your your you know the designs and the the, the structures to, to do the brunt of the work. There was a lot of emphasis at the time on on thermal mass, on getting away from mechanical systems. Seems to be more emphasis nowadays into you know technology and controls and lots of technology that reduces energy use. At the time, there was much more emphasis on doing things with less technology. And if we could just combine those two, you're right. It's been an interesting exactly. uh, path from banking on technology to, to rescue us here. So obviously, um, you know, you were into sustainability early. You know, was there anything else that inspired you? When did you really know you wanted to make a career out of sustainability? Well, um, that was my first opportunity because I, I was a, a project director at the time, managing some of our capital projects, uh, state buildings that were in design and construction. So I had that, that opportunity open, and, 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 it, and here was a chance to, in, my, in that same role, take on uh, and work full-time at something that up to that point had been more of a hobby and a background. Gotcha. That I that I had in my life, so it was uh, it was different, but it was something that I I really enjoyed. It, it I'll, I'll say it was definitely an uphill battle, especially in the early years. Oh, I bet. And I know you've spent a lot of time on the contracting side, big projects, but you've also volunteered on some different task forces on the policy side, and and also some trade organizations. So I'm sure you've been a mentor to others along the way. But rewind. You know, who else had some influence on you? Those books you've mentioned had some influence on you. I'm going to link to those books in our podcast show notes. But, you know, who else had some influence on you? Any mentors along the way? Yeah, I've, I've mentioned a few. Uh, you know, my, my family was a big influence on me. I know when I was uh, in growing up, I used to go spend summers when I was in high school with my grandfather. He was a builder. Oh, nice. And he had a big parcel of land that had been subdivided, and we would build a home every every summer. So here was a chance to get you know hands on. Uh, and in fact, after the first year, um, we would actually uh, you know during the year in school, I would design a house, and then that summer we would build a house. Wow! And we did that did that several times. So you know here's a 
a chance for, uh, to kind of learn as you do, uh, learned some of the, the good ways, and things that worked, what didn't work. It was a way to get immediate results and, and uh, learning an important part of thing, you know, design being practical as well. That's one of those that you don't really put on the resume, but it's uh, really, you know, immersed you into, sounds like design and building every summer. That's, uh, and that's, that's some great training right there. Yeah. Oh, that's a great opportunity as a kid growing up to for you. design and build houses that you design. So. Man, good for you. Uh, well, I'm sure that was one of the uh, proudest achievements, but you know, Dan, what are some other proudest achievements uh, so far? Well, by far, my my proudest achievement uh, is is more personal. That's my family. My I met my wife, and we were married 34 years ago. I've got three great children that are pursuing. They're in school, pursuing their own careers. None of them in architecture, but uh, okay. uh, they've been a great influence for me in my life. Um, as far as my career, I'm probably most proud of my work developing green building policies for the state. I've, I've served under four different administrations and under the last three, uh, very, very much more involved. In 2004, I participated with, uh, in the development of Governor Schwarzenegger's executive order, S-2004. At that time, we took a leap of faith that and became the first government entity to require LEED certification for both new and existing buildings. Fantastic. And we also set an energy target. So that was a, kind of a big first step that we took in, in the policy realm. And in 2011, um, I worked with Governor Brown's office uh, leading the development of his landmark green building, Executive Order B-1812. This, we filled all the gaps that uh, weren't really covered in Schwarzenegger's administration established targets uh, for zero net energy, carbon redu- emission reductions, energy and water use, environmental, environmentally preferable purchasing, electric vehicle infrastructure. We just covered everything we could think of at the time. And thinking uh, kind of at the time that you know you sh- you aim high and and you feel fortunate if if um, if the governor approves half of them, uh, well, he sure. basically approved everything we put forth, and even threw in a couple things of his own. So it was a challenge, but we it was very gratifying. And then they turned around and said, okay, now do it. <laughs> and we had never done a zero net energy building. Didn't fully understand what it meant, but uh, we had to learn and help define that as we went along. Yeah. Uh, it's called innovation, and uh, you got to be proud of that. I mean, uh, California, I, I get to travel for work and do a lot of trainings and work on lead projects and well projects. I'm fortunate in the green building movement that's been good to me. And, and California as an entire state is clearly a leader, you know, whereas, say, other cities like New York just passed some legislation last week, I'm sure you're familiar with, on the greenhouse gas emission side for the existing buildings in Manhattan and, and the boroughs. And so it just... You know, I think there's some cities that are, are doing a pretty good job at your entire state, and it's, uh, it's a big deal that you guys are leading the way. So it's, it's been wonderful to have that level of support. You know, I was also fortunate to be involved over a number of years with uh, in different roles in the U.S. Green Building Council. It's been a, a wonderful organization. I've served on their board of directors a couple of times, and both early on in, the, in, in that organization as well as in the later years. And served on a lot of different uh, committees. That's an amazing organization. That, you know, their strength is in thousands of volunteers at all levels. Some with with much expertise, others with lots of energy, and they all work together to improve buildings and communities. It's been great. Fantastic. Um, help me unpack the policy side for a minute, Dan. Is you know, for those listening. You know, California is a leader. You know, were you trying to stay on target with 2030 challenges, 2050, or or no? This is just how we want the buildings that are built or the large existing buildings in our state to. We've got to give that nudge. Is some of it a public-private partnership? So just you know, does it line up with certain bigger goals, or is it just you know what we have an opportunity here to write the rule book and we think this is the right way to go about things? Well, that's a good question. You know, we've we've certainly been looking at a lot of the national policies and programs involved. We've looked a lot to the federal government uh, and, and some of their leadership 
and, and policies and decisions that they've made. Some of those we've, uh, you know, after doing research, and you know, we've we've been able to work closely with a lot of experts, both internally in state government as well as externally. We we partner with a lot of people in federal and local government, the private sector, utilities, and we've, you know, these professionals have all been just great partners and help us help share their expertise and, and advise us on some of the policies as we've as we move forward. So it's been, you know, we haven't been afraid, you know, California has never really been one to sit back and, and wait to watch and see what other states do. So, you know, we've, we've uh, moved forward and taken some, some pretty bold steps and, and it put into place some really nice policies that, that have kind of put a lot of the, put the spotlight on us in some, in some ways, uh, some pretty bold moves, but uh, we're, figuring out how to implement those roles and and targets and and uh, I'm real happy about the way those are moving forward. Excellent. Yeah, I know California is the top 10 state for lead. It is year over year and it's not just on the public side but the private side too. So, uh keep leading the way and you know, sometimes you need to give that nudge for others to to innovate and say actually that is that is doable. We can do it. Maybe we have to do a little faster than some other states, but it's the right thing to do. And there's a big ROI there, of course, on lead and energy savings, and and you know that. Um, Well, fast forward to today. What's keeping you busy? What kind of projects uh, can you speak about? What are you working on today? Yeah, so Zero Net Energy has been a key focus of mine for the past several years. You know, we implemented a policy in uh, 2017 to design and build all new state buildings and major renovations to zero net energy. So that's something that is current and ongoing. We currently have probably around 4 million square feet of both large and small office buildings and designer construction that are becoming zero net energy. Fantastic. Even bigger task is to get 50% of our existing building area to zero net energy by 2025. So for us and for the state, for state, uh, that's about 55 million square feet of buildings. These are existing buildings. Some of them, you know, over 100 years old. Some of them are very inefficient. So we, as we set about to define what that meant, we determined that uh, we needed to set targets, energy efficiency targets, because a zero net energy building is an energy efficient building that that uses its Uh, own uh, renewable energy to offset entire energy use over the course of a year. So we, the first question was, well, what is energy efficient? We couldn't find a definition anywhere of, you know, a target for energy efficiency. So we based that on our own energy use. We established targets at like a top 25% efficiency target of all of our different building types. We have about, we determined about 36 different major building types and user types in state government. And then we have 16 different climate zones. So we were able to establish based on our own historical data and top quartile efficiency targets for our buildings. And those are what we've been working for. Yeah, for those listening, I mean, there's what Dan's talking about is is true net zero, right? All the energy we need, it comes from on-site renewables. Uh, Dan, there's also what you can net out to zero, right? Or net zero by offset. So, you know, maybe we pull from renewables during the day and at night we pull from the grid, but it nets out in our favor. Or maybe we're just buying lots of offsets. So, you know, which of those are, are you a fan of? Obviously, true zero energy is where we want to be, but are you allowing it? Yeah, Offset. When possible, we try to get as much on-site as we can, but we are recognizing, especially in the existing building market and in urban locations, it's not always possible on-site. So we, we do allow off-site renewable energy, but it needs to be a long-term dedicated renewable energy, not just buying wrecks somewhere. Wow. So in our case, that you know, we, we've been able to procure a lot of renewable energy on-site through power purchase agreements and off-site through community solar agreements. And each of these terms are like 20 years or more wow. terms. They lock in our rates. Uh, so we, we're blessed to have fixed energy rates over a 20-year period. So 
we heard from one of our utilities recently that the rates were proposed to go up about four percent or so the next two each of the next two years. Well, our rate is fixed, so our rate will remain pretty much the same. And so over the course of of these years, we're saving millions of dollars in you know long-term operating costs at no additional cost to us. Yeah. So it's been a it's been really you know I've heard people say oh we can't afford to be zero net energy so but zero net energy is an energy efficient building which I think everyone has shown is a you know proven that energy efficient buildings can be very cost effective and renewable energy which we have shown can save us tons of money over just buying from the grid. Well, that's just a good business move. I mean, you're, you're locked in at a fixed rate uh, with those those power purchase agreements, the community solar. And, you know, let's say you're a class A office building in a big city in California. It's, yeah, you, you've got to get as energy efficient as possible. And if you can't put the renewables on your building, I'm happy to hear that you, it needs to be dedicated renewables in your region. That just, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, through in California. So we have currently about 20% of our department's portfolio is zero net energy now. Uh, through those definitions, we've been working hard on our efficiency and we're, we're working to obtain even more renewable energy to get to uh, our 50% and beyond. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a projects question, deep retrofits. Uh, you know, what do you like to spend money on, on some of your existing California buildings on, on the retrofit side? Is it LED lighting? Is it HVAC deep retrofits? Is it behavior with the tenants? Where, where are you moving the dial here lately? It is a combination of a number of those. Uh, we have a, a team in our office that works a lot with the ESCOs so that sure. it doesn't necessarily have to come directly out of uh, building sure. budgets. Nice. Um, but it typically will include uh, a lot of lighting retrofits, controls, uh, some deeper retrofits, uh, you know, looking at HVAC systems, you know, chillers, cooling towers, a lot of the, the bigger equipment, a lot of efficiency, especially, you know, if we have equipment that is really old and it's scheduled to be replaced, then there's not an additional cost to go and replace it with something that's much better, you know, and it's worth a little bit of extra investment to get something ultra efficient. And uh, so we've had a lot of success yeah. doing that. Very smart. Yeah, Dan, let's say you had a crystal ball. I know you're really focused on zero net energy, which is amazing. You know, where do you think the sustainability, the green building movement, where's it shifting next? Zero net carbon. Mm. That definitely seems to be the direction we're going. California is definitely headed in that direction. And from what I see, so is the rest of the country. So we have uh, several new buildings in design or construction that, in addition to being uh, targeting zero net energy, will also be zero net carbon. So we're getting away from combustibles in, in a lot of our new new projects. And it's I think that's likely to increase. I would expect that new policy would come out uh, soon. Uh, to support or even mandate state buildings being zero carbon for the the coming years. We're also starting to require uh, environmental product declarations uh, for some of the building materials on our buildings. So we're requiring the uh, manufacturers on those buildings to provide declarations about about their embedded carbon. And this will likely uh, increase as carbon becomes more of a focus. Sure. And uh, and then we'll uh, most likely uh, eventually establish uh, some limits on uh, embedded carbon in various building materials to help drive the industry to reduce carbon in the manufacturing process too. Man, that that is exciting me, and that's some true thought leadership for those listening. Uh, you heard it here: zero net carbon. But also, we don't talk about enough that embodied energy, that embodied carbon. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that that you're really taking a serious look at that. That makes a lot of sense. You know, what's more eco-friendly styrofoam cups or a ceramic mug? Well, that ceramic mug took a lot of energy to make. Yes, the styrofoam 
you know, may not be recyclable in all areas. So just, you can have that debate back and forth, but we're not looking at that enough. Anything else on what you're reading up on? Uh, zero net carbon, I, I second that. That's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, that's been, that really seems to be uh, becoming a much more major focus. I know we the, the state has had a lot of interest in that and okay. passed some legislation in the past couple of years that are really pushing us in that direction. They've, they're requiring, uh, for example, the uh, state you know, electricity by 2045 to be totally zero carbon. So that's uh, putting a lot of pressure on utilities to continue to improve their renewable portfolio standard to where it'll basically be all renewables uh, in you know the coming 20 25 years be here before we know it um let's uh let's talk a little more about you uh, some rapid fire questions here uh what's your specialty what's your gift what do you think you're best at well i think one of my strengths is that i've sat on multiple sides of the table i've I worked as a policy developer in my current role uh, to help determine, uh, you know, where the state should head. I've uh, helped to determine how we implement them as an architect. I've designed green buildings and understand what's involved in that process. As a builder, I've I've built into projects these many of these same elements. As an owner, uh, both. The private, a private owner, as well as uh, representing commercial and public organizations, and and as an instructor, trying to um, relay this information uh, to others. Uh, so, you, with these experiences, I'm not afraid to do things for the first time because you know, I understand what you know the main processes are involved. So, yeah. I think that has been kind yeah. of a uh, has helped me a lot. Oh, tremendously. I mean, you've literally, like you said, worn each of those hats, uh, lots of different approaches, uh, what's in it for each one of those parties. Uh, let's talk about your, your, your teaching at uh, UC Davis. Uh, you know, we'd spoke earlier, you're passionate about that. You've been doing that for about 13 years. So paint a picture for us. What, what kind of teaching are you doing there at the college level? All right. So I, uh in that program, and this is through their extension program, which is for you know continuing education for professionals, and in many cases, it's people who are looking to for a change in their careers uh, or to enhance their current careers. So I've uh, helped develop uh, a couple of the courses and some of the certificate programs they have. One is on green building materials and construction now, it's, which has been a blast. And then I also helped develop a lead certification uh, class there, building certification uh, that I taught for the first 10 years. So that's been a, it's been a fun experience. I've enjoyed interacting with uh, students from various backgrounds. We've had international students, people from uh, building profession, people from other professions that are wanting to change or wanting to just out of interest. It's been really fun. Uh, I can tell. I mean, those are the the hot topics that it's not just the students just now getting out, but some, you're right, changing careers. And, and some of our listeners are in that boat too. And I'm going to ask you some for some advice for them in just a minute. But first, Dan, I'm a fan of the bucket list. And I'm just curious, what are one or two things maybe on your bucket list? Yeah, so th- that's a, a fun question to think about. I, about 40 years ago, I lived in Europe for a couple of years, and I'd really love to go back there and, and stay for an extended period, a year or two. I think that would just be so fun. I, I learned so much from that culture and from um, you know being back there where sustainability is has been around for centuries. They're so far ahead of us over there. And even back in the 80s, it, it would just amaze you how much they had already embedded into their culture, mm-hmm. as well as technologies, not just all passive stuff, but, you know, they definitely build things to last there. I'd also like to, uh, you know, when I'm thinking, how would I like to end out my career? And uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'd really like to kind of shift my career focus back to my roots of architecture. It's been you know, I'd like to build on what I've been practicing and preaching during these policy years. I've, I've done this to a smaller extent on my own homes, but kind of feel a yearning to go back to these roots. 
Love it. That is a good bucket list. Uh, actually, uh, this summer I get to teach a well AP class in Stockholm in Sweden. Never been. And oh, wow. Really, really excited to make that. Uh, that would be fun. Well, let's wrap it up here. Uh, you've made a career out of the green building movement. Uh, like you said, you've seen it from all angles. Nate, any advice for anyone jumping into this movement now or, or maybe something you wish you knew a little earlier in your career? Yes, absolutely. My, my advice is you know, follow your passion. Mm. But first look at how you can integrate sustainability or whatever your passion is into your existing work job and life that way you don't necessarily derail your career advancement path you know some people think you've got to to take this on you have to leave it Dieter F. Uchtdorf said lift where you stand that applies to sustainability as well you don't always have to leave your current job or location to advocate and pursue sustainability or green building in your career if you don't feel like if you feel like you'd be better starting off in a new fully sustainability oriented career, don't expect that it's going to make you rich, especially if you're already coming from a fresh professional field. So, you know, uh, some people think everything's just going to be rosy. Just, you know, I, I knew a, uh, an attorney that took one of my classes and he was leaving a very well-paying job. And I said, well, you know, you know, you won't make as much in this field. And he says, that's right. I really want to do this. Mm. Oftentimes, especially early on, you may find and feel that you're you're working alone or fighting an uphill battle. Change takes time in cultures and especially in large organizations or government it takes it takes time. You have to be patient, have to stay on your path, work at different levels to help them others to support your your views. The higher up you can get support, the easier your path will be whether it be with supervisors, managers, directors, all the way up to the CEOs or governors, it'll be easier to implement the higher up your support goes. And finally, I, you know, I would say start at home and in your personal life. If, if, you're, you know, if you can fully embrace green building and sustainability, it needs to become part of your lifestyle. It helps to have the support of your family and friends because it uh, can be a, a kind of a thankless path in, in some ways, but, you know, start at home. Those are some great words of wisdom. And uh, I was taking some mental notes myself, Dan, because, uh, you know, I, I heard, you know, follow your passion, but you have to be patient too and to make change. And, and yeah, it's not too late to jump over into this movement, uh, even if you've already been working in another career. And so uh, I just want to wish you luck on the bucket list and uh, I wish you look on just, you know, getting back into, uh, you know, influence and more in your, your circle of influence. So lead fellow Dan Burgoyne with the state of California. He's the sustainability manager. And Dan, thanks for being on the podcast. You bet. It's a pleasure. I just want to say thank you to our loyal listeners. We actually are celebrating over one year here on the Green Building Matters podcast. Me and the entire team were stoked and just so glad you continue to listen every Wednesday morning to a new interview with a green building professional here in this industry or just some pro tips that we want to make sure that you are getting straight from us, straight to you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to gbes.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues. And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.